bike build. When you hear that term on the internet, it means someone's going to pour obscene amounts of time and money into a bike, make something beautiful that performs awesome and is worthy of your envy, and then never race it. So this project definitely cannot be called a bike build because I'm not going to meet any of those requirements. I don't have money or time to spare on this thing. It will remain a butt ugly rust bucket with just enough performance to get by with and I'm going to race the crap out of it. So it's the year 2020 now. Really excited for the year, but the problem is my garage is kind of like less of a garage and more like a graveyard of bikes right now. So it kind of leaves me with the XR250R and that could be the ticket for me this year because it's not, it's not like terribly low performance. But let's see if this thing will even start because I haven't even started it in like four months. All right. Please work. She's only smoking a lot. Is it just me or is something on fire? It appears to be from the wiring, but let's just not start the thing again until I've gone through it all. To fully appreciate this bike, you have to know its story, which for me starts way, way long ago. Uh, back in the days before the great XR shortage, which has driven XR prices to ridiculous points, like above $3,000. I've seen them listed at like $6,500 around here, which is just ridiculous. They're not worth that. Anyway, a long time ago, I was living in California. I was looking for any street legal bike I could find, and there was a lot of XRs out there. Lots of plated XRs. They were just like mild performance bikes that nobody wanted. So they were not expensive back then. They're really cheap. And I found one and the owner was asking 950 for it for this 98 XR250R street legal. And with so many other better condition ones for sale, 950 was a little bit steep for that thing. So he ended up letting me take it for 650 bucks and he threw in a neck brace, a really expensive neck brace which I sold for 200. So I basically came away with that bike for $450. I then proceeded to ride the thing into the ground multiple times. I was using it as my primary means of transportation for a while, and I always used it as a weekend toy. So it got a whole lot of use over the years, and it ended up in the condition that you see here. So at the beginning of this year, I decided it would be fun to do something different this year and take that old bike and turn it into something that I would enjoy racing for the entire year. And in this video, I'm gonna explain all the things that were done to get this bike through to the checkered flag of the six hour endurance race at Glen Helen this year in the Ironman class. Before this year's project, the bike did already have some modifications that had just been done to it over the years, but really not all that much. Like how the front end was swapped to a XR400 front end. That swap was done a few years ago as a performance upgrade over the original front end. And I mostly did that because there was a lot of internet hype around that swap and XR400 front ends were just really cheap on eBay so I figured why not and I think that swap was worth the time because there are some fairly significant differences between the 
400 front end and the 250 front end that make the 400 front end more desirable. The fork tubes are 43 millimeter compared to 41 millimeter on the original forks. The front wheel axle is 17 millimeter compared to 15 millimeter on the original axle. And those two things combined do increase the rigidity of the front end a substantial amount, so there's noticeably less wallow in that front end. The 400 front end also has externally adjustable rebound damping, which the 250 front end does not. But both front ends use the same style of inverse bending shim stacks for the cartridge damping. And basically that's just like a really restrictive way of doing cartridge damping. So that just means when you're setting up your damping, uh, you're, that those sharp hits are going to be more controlled by like the flow limitation of that type of valve rather than your actual shim stack setup. But when I actually started messing around with the 400 front end and tuning it, I found that I could pretty much get past that by just starting with a really low viscosity oil that wouldn't be very restrictive and just setting the damping from there. So I, I don't notice a whole lot of spikiness to the to the damping as it is set up. And I didn't have to spend money on a valve conversion, like switching it to some other model of base valve or using Racetech gold valves. So this front end on that bike really is just a stock 400 front end that I did some homemade tuning on. The front wheel that I'm using is still even my original XR250 wheel, just with XR400 spacers and bearings thrown in it. The fuel tank was already a four gallon IMS tank because a few years ago, the original tank broke. Yeah, that's right, XR owners. We're, we're allowed to poke fun at crushed radiators and boiling coolant right up until the moment that we drop our exposed fuel tank onto a rock and it breaks open. Then we lose that card forever because the whole, but my XR is reliable and it doesn't overheat thing really goes out the window when you're standing there watching the fuel pour from your bike and there's nothing you could do. But anyway, yeah, big tank, four gallons, three hours of runtime, it's pretty sweet. The muffler was already an FMF Q4, which I threw on there not for performance reasons, but because the previous owner uh, sold the bike with one of those old White Brothers E-Series Super Trap style fart can things, and it just sounded like ass. So that FMF is on there, not for performance reasons, but just to make the bike sound like less ass. The engine on this thing also had some unoriginal equipment because like I said I ran it in the ground over and over and rebuilt it a few times. The cylinder was bored out to 77 millimeter using a JE piston so that brings it to 277 and the head was rebuilt using oversized valves because I completely trashed it using an aftermarket cam. But after that rebuild, I did go back to a stock cam. So it's really just a 277 with a stock cam, everything else stock. And the only other thing is I had Barnett clutch springs thrown in there to help it handle that extra power from the 277. So when I started this year's project of getting it ready to race against all those KTMs, I definitely had a challenge on my hand because from the day that I started actually working on it, I had 10 days until the first race. So a bit of a time crunch. And since I don't have the time to just like work on it all day anymore, um, that, that was pretty challenging. But here's what I managed to get done in that time. The first thing was removing junk. So all the old dual sport lighting, I wasn't gonna use lighting at all. So I just got rid of all the wiring and cleaned the built up just gunk off the entire bike. The most time consuming part of that was getting all of the crud out of the cooling fins. The valve cover gasket had been leaking forever, so every single ride it would leak out all over all those cooling fins and then get coated with dirt and then it would just bake on there. And since where I live I can't just wash a vehicle, you're just not allowed to do that. I couldn't just wash it after a ride so I ended up just never washing it. Probably seven years ago is the last time this thing got a wash at all. And then as I was lifting the bike onto a stand to start doing other work on it, I noticed that the rear wheel wobbled so bad that you could see it. A lot of the times when a wheel bearing is bad, you can, you can just feel for the play. This thing wobbled so bad you could see it wobble. So the, the rear wheel bearings had to go. And then while I had the wheels off, I went ahead and just changed 
changed the tires. And I know everyone's really picky for their tire selection. They want to know like what tire is best for this situation and that situation. So I'm going to let you in on my secret method that I use for determining exactly which tire is going to be perfect for the situation. So here's how it works. You go to Rocky Mountain, you go to the dirt tires section, you sort by lowest price, and then you buy the first one that fits. And that's how I ended up with another set of Kenda Trackmasters. Those things just really set themselves apart with that low price every time. The rear shock on this bike was completely blown. I didn't have time to do a rebuild. I, I will get to it because I do want to make sure that I finally get a shock on there that feels good to me. Uh, but I just didn't have time. So what I did was just went on eBay and for $100 I got a shock that was in way better condition and was not blown and I just threw that on. Uh, but once I had the shock off, I did start to have dark thoughts of just doing this. And I could have made that work for sure. It was, it was like a few millimeters off from just bolting up. But the spring on that thing is like 10% too soft. Uh, it probably would have worked, probably would have been better than an XR250R shock, but I wasn't gonna like bolt it all up and waste the time chancing it because I was like seriously, seriously short on time. So I just went ahead and for this race, I just used the, the eBay XR250R shock. The foot pegs on this thing were both bent in opposite directions. So when you're riding it, it felt very awkward because one foot was like way forward and one foot was way backward. Uh, so those had to go. And then the shifter that I had on there was not even for that model of bike. So it stuck out way too far and you couldn't even, you could hardly even get your foot on the peg. It was just weird. So that had to go as well. But what I noticed when I was changing the shifter out was that when I tried to put an original shifter on there, the foot peg was bent up in a way that blocked me from putting an original shifter back on there. So fortunately there's a precision tool that I like to use in this situation and that rectified the situation. I got the shifter on there and then I tried to shift it and it wouldn't because the foot peg was still too bent too far and it was contacting the bottom of the shifters not letting it downshift. Fortunately I still had that precision tool right there with me and I just went to work with that precision tool even more and it works. For the pegs I ended up using a set of IMS brand pegs and I went with those pegs because they're roughly the same size as the standard pegs on the CRF 250X and 450X which I like. They're not oversized pegs I would say they're just like standard sized peg. Another thing I had to fix was the Kickstarter. It felt like it was ready to just seize in place. And that was just because like 23 years of built up metal shavings and dirt. So all I had to do was just take it apart, clean it out, and it was just like new again. The clutch side cover was leaking really bad. So I went ahead and took the side cover off to replace the gasket. And then I recalled that the last time I rode this bike, the clutch just didn't have the grab that it used to have. So I got in there and took the clutch springs out and found them to be significantly sacked out. So I just made some shims to bring them back to the, the original length. Uh, I didn't get any coil bind, so I figured good to go. Next time it's apart, I'll replace them, but this time I didn't have time to wait on an order of clutch springs. With the oil lines disconnected from the side cover, I also took this opportunity to replace those oil lines because I had some ghetto fixes in place before this. And I also replaced all the seals and crush washers in that system of oil lines just to make sure I wasn't gonna have any leaks trying to put it back together. And then I also checked the oil reservoir bottom strainer because that apparently has a tendency to get clogged up, but in this case, uh, it wasn't clogged at all. I went on to replace the leaking valve cover gasket and I ended up getting stuck in Honda's top bolt trap like I always do. But once I was in there, I found the cam, cam chain, and rockers to all still be in good condition. So I didn't have to mess around with any of that. Not like I would have had time to do that anyway, but just good to see that it was all still in good condition after 
so many years of just getting thrashed on. I went on to replace the spark plug just in case and found that the spark plug was like finger tight. And that's where my startup smoke was coming from because the valve cover gasket was leaking oil into that spark plug well and then it would just trickle down the threads of the spark plug and into the cylinder. Should have checked that torque maybe once in all those years, but it continued to run, so whatever. Along with the new spark plug, I installed a new coil because I got one super cheap. And then I moved on to the big part of this project, which was performing a carb swap. And I did this for a couple reasons. First, because I'm not a big fan of piston valve carburetors like the one that comes stock on the XR. 100% of the time, when you compare a bike using a flat slide versus a piston valve, the piston valve has way softer delivery. And that could be good for some people in some situations, but I really prefer the much sharper response that you get with a flat slide. It feels a lot higher performance, even if you aren't really getting a bigger horsepower number. Just switching to a flat slide, it feels good. And then second, this bike is bored over quite a bit. Uh, 277 from 250, that's a big jump. And to get back to the original ratio of the 30 millimeter carburetor bore, and 249cc displacement. At 277cc, to get back to that ratio, I should have been using a 33mm carburetor, but there aren't a whole lot of 33mm carburetors that would make an easy fit. So I ended up going with a K104 32mm, and that's a PWK style carburetor from OKO. So it's that D slide type of flat slide carburetor, and I haven't seen anyone use one of those on an XR250 before. So I was pioneering this carb swap, just doing it from scratch without having seen someone else do it before. So that added some extra time. But anyway, the fitment of that carburetor was easy. It slides into the original manifold and it clears the rear shock. So all you have to do is build an intake from the carburetor back. And then with it all put together, I started kicking to see what would happen if it would even go with the jetting that the carburetor came with. So yeah, without any adjustments, it did start and it did idle fine, but it wasn't good for anything other than just putting around. As soon as you got deep into the throttle at all, it would bog out. It was just way too lean. I spent a lot of time working my way up in the jet sizes until I got everything working really well. And man, once that thing was working really well, it was so much better than that stock carburetor. Sharper throttle response and the power just carries out so much farther compared to the stock carburetor. The day that I finally got that thing dialed in, that was the day I had to pack up and leave. I, I was planning on getting to Glen Helen the day before with like plenty of time to spare. Fortunately, I was able to go hang with Sub D and do a morning ride with him. Thank goodness I did that riding beforehand because I hadn't like really done any practice, any real practice, or any real hard riding at all since the 24 hour race last year. So thank goodness that I got to do some practice because I don't, I, I was in for some hurt if I didn't do that because as soon as we got out there and I actually started to do some hard practice, I realized my entire body and muscles were just freaking out. They were no longer accustomed to riding. Everything was tensed, arm pump like crazy, could not feel my hands, and that was a good opportunity to just force myself through it so that I could figure out how I was gonna do this for six hours of racing the next day. And then after that, it was time to race the six hour endurance race, solo in the Ironman class.
Things went really well off the start. I came into the pits on the first lap in 10th position out of a field of 40, which was the strongest starting lap I've had at one of these endurance races. And I thought that was a really good sign because I always make my moves during a race later on as everyone else starts to slow up and I just keep trucking. So I thought for sure I was about to have my best endurance performance yet. I climbed up to eighth position during the second lap and just felt freaking unstoppable. And then the problem started. During the third lap, I somehow hit off my right foot peg spring. So it kept folding up on me and causing me to mess up my lines. And that itself only hurt my lap times a little bit, but I tried to push a little harder to make up for that and ended up crashing a lot, falling back to 13th before learning my lesson and riding more conservatively to survive with the disappearing foot peg. Instead of going harder to try to make up for it, that was dumb and that didn't work. But I did work my way back up to eighth position, two hours and 45 minutes into the race. And at that time, I peeked into my fuel tank as I putted through the pits on that lap because I know I'm normally good for three hours on this tank and then I'll hit reserve and then I have a matter of minutes. And I saw that the fuel level was still barely above the on position straw. So I thought I was going to be good for the next lap, like just barely. And making it just over three hours before fueling would have been so good and so strategic because that would mean I only needed to stop that one time for that fuel stop during the race and I wouldn't have needed to make any other stops and that would have been a huge advantage because you lose a lot of time in the pits when you're doing stuff. And I was also just a matter of seconds behind seventh place so I really wanted to stretch it and use that nice light bike that had an empty tank to just put in a fast lap, close the gap and just make the pass. But again here, racing less conservatively bit me and this time it bit me real hard. I was out there midway through the lap, but shortly afterward I felt the bike lean out. So I reached down to flip it to reserve. And in the process of doing that, I both crashed and yanked the fuel line off of the carburetor. So now the bike was on the ground, leaking out all the rest of my reserve and dust from the crash coated the fuel line and the fuel inlet on the carburetor. And I did what I could to wipe away the crust of dirt as much as I could, just wipe it away and wash it away before I put the fuel line back on. But even then the damage was done. The, there was junk that got into that fuel inlet. So the float valve was immediately messed up by that debris clogging it up. And from then on the carburetor could no longer produce the correct fuel level in the float bowl. So then it took me 10 minutes to get the bike started because I was manually hunting the fuel level using the petcock. And as I was doing that, I just watched rider after rider pass me by and it was just freaking heartbreaking. The little bit of fuel reserve I had left nearly got wasted during the 10 minutes of tediously filling the float bowl, trying to start it, draining a bit out of the bowl to try to get the level correct, trying to start it, just over and over hunting that fuel level and until eventually I finally nailed it and got it started. So I nursed it back to the pits refueled and just nursed it along as best as I could with an overflowing carburetor by just keeping the RPM up so it wouldn't bog out. And unfortunately, it got really hot in the slow sections from doing that lap after lap. I was doing that for the next three hours and that really did a number on the engine. I finished it out in 13th out of 40, which definitely isn't the result I was looking for. That's not the kind of position I should be achieving. And I was upset about that at first. And I'm not even gonna try to make excuses and like say that that is an okay position for me to be in. But like still looking back at it, I do think I did what I could to salvage the race after I made all those mistakes. So I'm not saying I'm totally fine with the outcome and I'm not saying I'm pissed about it. But what I am saying is I am definitely fueled by that outcome to do better at the next one. Because seeing my lap times and seeing how I was just charging ahead, gaining position, and then I'd have a big mistake, fall back, but then able to salvage it back. Um, seeing that, I know that if I can keep the bike together 
for an entire race, <laughs> I will be on fire. So that does, that does make me feel good and I really wanna do well at the next one. So that's the situation that we leave off with. The bike is fried. When you push the Kickstarter through, it just pushes through. It doesn't build any compression. So I did fry the thing. The XR killed in action, but that's probably okay. So at worst, head rebuild or new head and maybe a, a cylinder bore or maybe even just get away with a hone. We'll see, we're, we're gonna take it apart. That'll be in another episode of this rust bucket racing thing if I'm able to continue this. But uh, who knows, this all might get the good old COVID-19 cancel that everything is getting right now. But we'll see.